Over two decades ago, Intel released the first of the fantastic Pentium 3 microprocessors hosting 9.5 million transistors and being based upon a 0.25 micron fabrication process. Being myself a late teenager at the time of that release, this processor's step change coincided with a truly sweet spot in history as internet technologies were really accelerating and a raft of generation defining games were being released for Windows 98. All of these coalescing together to make the last years of the 90s a bit of a golden age in PC gaming. Because of these reasons, this processor family is one that I hold dear to my nostalgic and sentimental heart. So in this video, let's dig a little more into the Pentium 3 desktop CPU over its lifetime. From its glittering rise at the start of its production run, exploring its various changes in architecture, and finishing up with its eventual fall from favor once the Pentium 4 architecture eventually met its performance and began to pull ahead and dooming the venerable P3 line to obsolescence. Welcome to Bite Size Thoughts, my little channel where I deal you a piping hot slice of 90s PC nostalgia with a smattering of retro console content. Subscribe if you also love this era and want to watch more little vids like this one. The first Pentium 3 cores released on February 26, 1999 were named Katmai and continued the single edge contact cartridge design similar to the late Pentium 2 chips that it was replacing. The highest speed Pentium 2 in fact have the same clock speed as the lowest Pentium 3 at launch, being a blazing fast 450 MHz. But in terms of differences between the two, the P3 architecture had implemented a new processor instruction set called SSE, which stood for streaming SIMD extensions. And SIMD is single instruction, multiple data. Don't you just love nested acronyms like that? Intel in 1999 were locked in a vicious corporate combat with AMD who were pushing their own rival core instruction set called 3D Now on their K6 and Athlon chips. So SSE included 70 new instructions for graphics and sound processing over and above what the MMX instruction had introduced a couple of years earlier. It was initially called KNI for Katmai new instructions as well as being referenced to as MMX2 by some before it was released. SSE greatly increased the efficiency of the core by allowing a type of parallel processing, but just like AMD's chip instructions, for SSE to be beneficial, they must be encoded in the software that was developed before you could see any performance benefits. High power graphics applications such as Adobe Photoshop supported SSE instructions for higher performance and Microsoft included support for SSE in its DirectX 6.1 and later video and sound drivers which were included with Windows 98 Second Edition, Windows ME, Windows NT4 and Windows 2000 operating systems. But I imagine a lot of games developers had to implement both or pick one over the other. Regardless of this, both AMD and Intel were racing each other for raw processor clock speed. Intel rapidly ramped up the megahertz output of the Katmai processors as Moore's law held firm. Only three months after the initial launch, the 550 megahertz processor was released, and within a further three months after this, a 600 megahertz CPU was available. By September of that same year, Intel launched a 533 and a 600 megahertz variant with 133 megahertz front side bus, boosting performance in a different way as the previous chips had been running on a 100 megahertz front side bus. As you can imagine, it was hard to keep up as a consumer and quite expensive if you wanted to be on the bleeding edge of tech. But if you were a hardcore gamer in 1999, then the leaps and bounds in CPU power would be lifting you to greater heights in the absolute classics that were released in that year. Remember, you would have been looking to pair your shiny new processor with a Voodoo 3 or a TNT 2 to seriously kick some ass in Quake 3, Unreal Tournament, Counter-Strike, Homeworld, Tiberian Sun, and dozens more assuming you had a decent connection to the internet that is. But Intel of course didn't stop there. In October, barely nine months after the initial release, the second generation of the Pentium 3 unveiled, which they named Coppermine. These were released for both slot one and socket 370 motherboards and was fabricated on a smaller 0.18 micron process. They flew out of the gate with a whole range of speeds from 500 MHz through to 733 MHz with variants created with either the 100 or 133 MHz front side bus to create multiple price points and upgrade paths. Intel as always used a fantastic marketing opportunity to make a big deal of an improved L2 cache on chip design which they catchily called Advanced Transfer Cache. 
ATC, which they said reduced latency and drive performance by running at 100% of the CPU speed. In any case, by May 2000, Intel had hit the heady heights of 1 GHz with the copper mine architecture. I still remember being astounded back then that a processor could hit those speeds and make it to that symbolic milestone. If you had one of these chips, you'd probably be looking to buy a Voodoo 4 or 5 or maybe a new GeForce 2 GTS to play through the recently released Soldier of Fortune and Deus Ex at max settings. Intel also said at the time that having L2 cache on die meant that this sped up the internet experience. But honestly, I don't know how much truth there was in that when I was still using a 56k modem at the time. But Intel sure continued to make up some crazy marketing stuff back in the day in their war with AMD. Intel's final revision of the P3 core was named Tualatin, based upon a 0.13 micron fab and released first in July 2001. This chip design drove clock speeds further from the 1 GHz up to a max of 1.4 GHz. However, these processors were not backwards compatible with older P3 motherboards, which meant upgrades were not always possible and did cause a bit of confusion in the market at release. In any case, a lot of retro PC enthusiasts love to build Windows 98 rigs based on this processor for the highest P3 performance available before having to move up to the frankly lesser loved P4 netburst architecture. In fact, the first Pentium 4 was released in November 2000, so there was almost a year of overlap between the two architectures. Intel was no longer able to squeeze further performance from the P3, and AMD's Thunderbird-based Athlon and Duron lines were started to take a lead speed-wise, so Intel had to invest more into the P4 lineup. It was April 2001 before the first P4 that truly overtook the P3 in performance was released at a 1.7 GHz clock speed. By August 2001, the P4 had hit 2 GHz and Intel had released a new 845 chipset which enabled the use of much cheaper PC133 SD RAM to be used. The twin features of an increase in clock speed paired with the use of cheaper RAM options finally allowed the P4 to rapidly replace the aging P3 and to become the top selling mainstream processor on the market, thus causing the Pentium 3, although much loved, to ultimately fall from favour for the average consumer. It's remarkable that this processor family only had two years of being at the cutting edge before the P4 came in and eventually displaced it. However, it must be noted that a modified version of the copper mine was used in the original Xbox console, which had its last game released for the console in 2008. So it lived on in many living rooms around the world for a good while longer. And that, my friends, is my short history, the rise and fall of the Pentium 3 processor and its three main variants. I hope you found that as interesting to watch as it was for me when researching this subject. I've omitted the Coppermine T variant as I think that could have its own mini video, as well as talking about the mobile Xeon and related Celeron processor chips. Again, something I'd like to revisit in another video. If you know of other good stories or tidbits related to the P3, then please pop them in the comment section and let's have a good discussion started. If you enjoyed this video, then take a look at my other mini history videos in this playlist here, or why not watch some videos on my current retro PC collection here. As always, I appreciate your time and hope you enjoyed the video. Take care of yourselves and see you in the next one.